Welcome back, everyone, to Crime and Entertainment. I am here with a very special guest. I'm a huge wrestling fan, for those of you that know me personally. So this is definitely an honor. We have Hall of Famer Charles Wright, better known to most of you in my era, the Attitude Era, as the Godfather. Charles, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for having me on the show, my brother. We're going to have some fun. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I figure, uh, you know, right off, let's just right off the bat. I know you are a big Jack Daniels fan. Oh, oh, wow. Look at that. That's what I drink, too. Yeah, the single barrel. When I drink. Bread. When you drink. I'm going to go ahead. We're, I'm going to start this bad boy well, off I, with a little well, shot. I, I just uh, I, just happy to have one here myself. The Dead Man Inc. Undertaker yeah. brand. Yeah, no, I, yours might be a little different than mine. I'm sure it's just as good. But uh, this is a little special blend that was made for The Undertaker. I see that. So salute, my brother. Salute to you, my friend. Let me get in the picture. I'm, I, I, I refuse to shoot this. I, I'll do half of it. Okay. Just because it's kind of blasphemy, you know? Yeah. It ain't a shoot. That what you drink in there, you're supposed to sip. Yeah, yeah. It's not a. It's not a shooter. It's a not a Jack shooter. Daniels number seven. <laughs> now number seven's in here. Okay. Yeah, but I got a little. I actually I'm switching. I got Jim Beam in this cup here. That's the Red Stag we talked about earlier. The Red the Kid Rock's Red Stag. Mm -hmm. My favorite. That's good stuff. That's it good. Is. That's good. Well, well, Charles, let's get right into it, man. Uh, where did you grow up? Where, where was where was that? I grew up in a place which is now called Silicon Valley, in Sunnyvale, California. Okay. And I was born at uh, Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto, which is up in Northern California. And uh, I was raised, I, you know, until I was 18, I lived in California until I went to college and I moved to Nevada. All right. Now you were, I mean, I've seen some, I've been doing some prep and research for you. Now you were a pretty good athlete coming up. You had, you were always a pretty tall guy before you started really hitting that power lifting. What all kind of sports did you play? Believe it or not, I did not play football in high school. I played basketball. And in 1979, I was Mid-Peninsula Basketball Player of the Year. And uh, that's pretty, I, I, I think my senior year, I know it was crazy. I was kind of like Charles Barkley. Um, I was 20 rebounds and 20 points a game my senior year. But here's the funny thing. I didn't want to play basketball. I wanted to play football. But wow. my mom and dad, thought I would get hurt playing football so they would never sign the release papers so they wouldn't let me play them you know I don't know about today but back then you listen to what your parents said oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't play any football I didn't play football until I went to college and uh when I went I got a basketball scholarship and then during that I got a football scholarship to go to UNR that Reno right. where I've never played football before but I got a scholarship to do it Wow. So you had never played football like at a, you know, professional. No, game. not, not, not with pads on, not with pads on. Wow. So they were just impressed by your, your size and stature, I'm assuming. And um, I think what they said is I was a good athlete and I had, I was quick and strong and I had, had good feet. What were you? O-line, O-line, D-line? They made me, a, they made me a right offensive tackle. Okay. Now, I mean, did you, you, did you like that better than basketball? Um, boy, that's so long ago. And I didn't play that long. I got hurt right away, man. I played for about a year. Oh, man. And I got hurt really bad. And uh, that ended just like my mom and dad said, you know. It yeah. ended my career. And so I didn't play. I, I enjoyed it while I did it, but I didn't play it long. Because once I got hurt, I kind of start turning into the person that I am today. <laughs> so when you got hurt did now and I, i'm not uh familiar with that so maybe you can shed some light you got a free ride when you get hurt like that what happens to the ride how does that work oh they honor it they honor, they honor it, it. Uh, they, they honor everything why i i left for a different reason i was just you know young dumb and full of you know what you know yeah. and uh <laughs> I, I started once i got hurt i started hanging out in strip clubs and drinking Jack Daniels and, and bodyguard strippers and 
ride motorcycles, all that kind of stuff. What now you were actually, you had a, a MC club you were a part of, right? Yeah, it was called Cheetahs out here in Las Vegas. Uh, they sold it uh, like three years ago. And so I got my little part of it. And uh, I've been out of that business since then. Okay. No, when well, you said riding bikes, you were a <laughs> member of a, I don't want to use the word gang, but you were a motorcycle, you were in a motorcycle club. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, uh, I ended up uh, joining, well, I, I started getting, let me see. I think it was around 82. Another thing that I always wanted was a tattoo, and I never got a tattoo. My mom and dad wouldn't let me get one in high school. Thank God I was going to get a Black Panther. <laughs> but uh, I moved to Vegas, <clears throat> bought, bought a Harley, had a 1955. I was a cowboy. Dude. People don't know. I was like a not a real, as, as close as you could be to a cowboy without being a cowboy. I was. <laughs> and... Uh, I had a 55 Ford pickup and a Harley and I uh, moved to Vegas because I came out here in Vegas in 83 because that was the first year that the national finals, NFR, national final rodeo. I know I, I was following that. It was in Oklahoma City every year and uh, it moved to Vegas. So I'm like, man, I'm going to Vegas, see the rodeo. And I came out here and I went to a bar. I, I asked around, what's the cheapest place to get drunk? Somebody's like, well, you can go to this place called Mr. G's. And you pay $5 or $10 all you can drink. I'm like, take me there. Right. When I walked in, the manager came up to me. And most people, a lot of people that know me really well call me Bear. Right. And so there, uh, I walked in a place and guy's like, dude, is your name Bear? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, dude, I was on a recruiting trip at Reno when you got in a fight and you threw a guy through a window. And then you went outside and picked up a car. And then you did this. Then you got on a Harley and did a burnout. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, that's me. <laughs> wow. And so he said, bro, he said, my dad owns strip clubs in Las Vegas. Now, at that point, I'm making $300 a week working hard, you know, and back then, wait, this is like in the early 80s. They weren't that good. Right. And so he goes, well, these dudes out here are making three, four hundred dollars a day. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, they make a lot of money. I went home, told my wife at the time, we're moving to Las Vegas. <laughs> And like within a month, because I'd worked for a trucking company, they moved everything out here to Vegas for me. And I've been here ever since, since about 84. Wow. Now, I Isn't don't that wanna, crazy? It is. I don't want to gloss over what you said. Now, you, you say you threw a guy through a window <laughs> or off a balcony. What was that? Let's, let's just touch on that for a moment. It was about UNR. It was back then, Nevada was one of the schools that you only needed like a 2.5 GPA to get into because they were having hard time getting students to come from other places to Reno or Las Vegas, especially right. Reno. So they lowered their grade point staff standards. So they got a lot of really good athletes that had bad grades, me included, <laughs> me included. <laughs> and so um, I was playing dominoes in a, I was in a dorm room for a short time before I got thrown out of the, the dorm for uh, this incident. <laughs> and so we were, me and a guy named Charles Mann, who played for the Washington Redskins. Yeah. Okay. He was a, a defensive end. Derek Kennard was offensive tackle for uh, Dallas. D. Munson, I, who played for Chicago for a short time, you wouldn't remember. And I got a place kicker named Tony Sandejas, who was in the league forever. We all lived together. And while we lived together afterwards, but we're playing dominoes, right? Long story short, uh, it's after hours, we're partying, you know, somebody downstairs is knocking on the thing. Hey, you guys be quiet. You know, we're telling them basically, hey, leave us alone. And he keep bothering me, big bother me. So then I get a phone call. I'm not going to use the word, but somebody says, listen here, the N word. Oh boy. He says, if you don't turn that music down, I'm going to come up there and kick your ass. And I said, don't come up here, brother. I'll be right there. <laughs> slammed the phone down, went downstairs, kicked down the door, mugged this dude, attacked the only dude that was in there, started mugging him up, threw him through the, the it was a, just a sliding glass door type, of, threw him through the window, but he went off the balcony and went two stories down, which isn't that far, it was in the snow. <laughs> okay. Well, I then, that a little bit. <laughs> so now I go back up to my room and now everybody's like, dude, you got to get out of here. They're going to call the cops and stuff. And then I find 
worked out that it wasn't that dude that called Charles Mann or one of them guys snuck out of the room and called me because there was no cell phones back then yeah. and pretended to be that dude. So that wasn't even the dude. That dude had no idea who I was breaking through that door and bugging him up. Yeah, oh. that's that's bear. So he took so a I got, free ride for, and yeah, then he wasn't even so, the one to say. <laughs> so I got thrown out of the dorm. It was called Nye Hall. I got thrown out of the dorm. And so they take me out of the dorm and they give me a stipend, which is you get so much money now to live in, a, in an apartment. And they put me in with those football players. I So, I mean, they went from the dorm to going with all these football players. So it got even worse. Oh, and then, like I said, then I got hurt. And then things just went kind of, I don't know if you call it uphill or downhill, but they went, they went on the hill. Right. <laughs> A little sideways, maybe from time to time. <laughs> I I started changing right there. <laughs> now, uh, if for people that that don't know, California is big. Uh, well, hometown Angels territory. Did uh, did your biker crew ever have any run-ins with those guys? Are y'all pretty cool with well, them? You have to do some research to go on my Instagram and go back and look at some of my posts. But our colors were red and white. I I seen that. And we were actually friends with those guys. We'd do the Redwood Run. Back then, black guys weren't, I don't know if black guys are loud and angels or not now, but they weren't then. So they were passing me off as Puerto Rican. I mean, call me whatever <laughs> fucking thing you want to call me. I ain't no Puerto Rican, though, but hey, I was just hanging out. Uh, what happened was is most of those guys in the club that I was in, they became HAs. Right. Uh, three of them are dead. Um, one's in Alaska. Jimmy's still alive. I think I think he's still alive, and Mamo's alive. And there's three of us still alive. And you know, but I don't have much contact with them. That was the picture. Was that the one that you had on the Stone Cold podcast? There. <laughs> yeah, I think see how big I was. Man, I was about to say, <laughs> dude, you were jacked. I mean, like that was, uh, <laughs> man. You know, you know what that was? That was Jack Daniels beer and chicken wings and pizza. And a lot of a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, I do all that, but the heavy lifting. I'm chicken wings, Jack Daniels, and pizza. I, <laughs> I skip on the lifting, but uh, I'm good. Uh, I'm good with all the rest of them. That's uh, when the strongman stuff just came out, and uh, yeah, I, I was I was able to go out there and back up against the truck, and with my legs and our, our car, I could lift the back of a car off the ground, and that was the big thing that I would do everywhere: is go lift cars off the back of the ground. I don't, other tires at least get the tires off the ground i don't doubt it man i'm gonna have to get that photo and and tag it with some posts here for advertisement for this thing because you i mean you were look like you were chiseled out of stone man in that thing um i was probably three 330 pounds there man it just i was power lifting just big big and strong that's a so long time ago now, what did you want to do at that point? I mean, where did you see yourself going? Because we you hadn't started into the wrestling yet. What 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 was your aspirations at that point? Were you just kind of living life by the day? I was kind of just living life like an old rodeo cowboy biker dude and living that life. And uh, wrestling kind of just I didn't even watch wrestling. I wasn't a wrestling fan. Yeah. I was I was a roller derby fan. Right. And people like Rick back in back in the 70s, bro. You know, when I was in my teens, shh, roller derby was the shit. Yeah. I mean, it was in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, it was much bigger there. The roller derby would sell out the, uh, what was it called? The Cow Palace. Yeah. And wrestling would only fill half the house. So, I mean, roller derby was much bigger than wrestling back then. Wow. Now, when did you, I, I've heard some stories. I know it, it was filming a movie there. That's kind of how you heard about wrestling and what made you kind of want to step into it that was over the top right with sylvester sloan yeah. mm -hmm. now you you weren't in that movie though were you, are you still drinking with me am I, am I the only one drinking now or are you still no, drinking sir. With me? absolutely we're gonna knock one down i mean come on you told me you picked up a bottle of jack so just for you yes okay wait 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 before you go any further remember where you are because with me you're gonna lose your place a lot <laughs> remember where you are all right we're over the top you out of out of respect to my friend Kurt Henning, come on, you know what we got to do. We got to gargle it. Let's do it. All right. We both go. Ah. Yeah. I, so I gotta ask before we step on the over the top here. 
what is the significance of gar- gargling? Because you said Kurt Henning, and for any of our listeners that don't know that aren't uh, followers of, of wrestling, Kurt Henning was Mr. Perfect. Now, Kurt Henning's obviously is his real name. And from what I understand, it was just something that he made people do when they would do the shot of Jack was he made it gargle. What was the significance of that? Um, I've heard a lot of different stories. I don't know the answer would be. It was, you got to gargle your jacket. I was like, okay, yeah, I don't give a fuck. All right. <laughs> so I never asked for an explanation. I was with uh, me, Bradshaw, Scott Hall, and Ron Simmons were all uh, at a, in a, tied up at an uh, airport for like three hours, one trip. And we were at, I was asking him that question. Everybody had a different answer. But it seems to me that it was that that was his way of making sure you drank it. Because back then, right. some guys would be known for throwing it over and not drinking it. So that, that's what uh, we kind of came to the conclusion. That was his way of making sure everybody drank it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's smart. <laughs> <laughs> I know that a lot of guys that, uh, you know, claim to can put down a lot. And that's probably a lot of times that's what they do. I've seen people, man, especially in bars. I knew this girl. She was a bartender. And she was like, look, she said, I can't buy all the shots people do. She said, if I did that, I wouldn't be able to fix people's drinks. So she would have a beer about half full, quarter of the way full. And when they would buy her the shot, she would shoot the shot and then pretend to chase it with the beer and spit it right back into the beer. And then said, yeah, yeah. A lot of people do that. Yeah. If you did that around us, you might get beat up. Yeah, I was about to say, that probably wouldn't be the right place to try something like that. We would take that insulting, even though a shot of Jack ain't going to make or break us. Right. That'd be very insulting. Uh, actually, there's I'm not going to mention names, Gold Dust, but there's, uh, and, and I, I love him to death. I shouldn't have said that. But there's been people uh, taken to court for not faking the, or I just say faking the funk. Right. You know, because we wouldn't make you drink, but if you decided to drink with us, if you decided to go out to be, with BSK and hit the clubs, bro, you, you better be part of it because right? we right. don't make you drink. <laughs> don't say you can hang if you can't hang. Yeah, that, that we're, that's definitely something I want to get into is the, the BSK. But uh, when we were talking about Over the Top, you, you weren't actually in that movie, were you? It was just being filmed where you were at or near where you were at? Um. I was working at a topless club called the Crazy Horse Saloon. Mm-hmm. It was maybe three less than a half a mile away from the MGM. And that's where they filmed that picture. A lot of the guys, and I can't remember their names, it's too long ago, but a lot of guys in that movie that were extra were wrestlers, weightlifters, mm-hmm. power lifters. And I, I mean, I wasn't a bodybuilder, but I was into the power scene. So a lot of people know who Bear was. And so they were, I was manager, bartender doorman back then you were everything and yeah. you know you just one one or two guys ran everything and so they would come into my club and they're like i was like you seen in that it was probably six months after that picture you're talking about was taken yeah that's when they they were come. that's how big i was they're like dude you should become a wrestler and i'm like man i don't want to do that phony ass wrestling shit and I'm, that's really what i said and they're like well have you heard of a guy named bam bam bigelow and i'm like the dude with the tattoos on his head, he rides a bike, don't he? I'm like, yeah, I know who he is. He's cool. I like him. They say, well, he made over a million dollars last year. And I went, what? How much? Doing that wrestling? I made one call to a guy. So uh, I think it was Scott Norton. Somebody, I called a guy named Larry Sharp at the Monster Factory. He's, he's dead now. And uh, I flew out there. He says, if you fly yourself out here, I'll put you. Because back then, you, there wasn't no phones. And then you could you right. couldn't send a picture of yourself. It would take a week to get a picture of me out there to him. Right. And so uh, I, I just remember I, I showed up out there. I just remember him looking at me when I walked off the off the plane. And he's just like, he goes, I tell you what, I'll train you for free. If you sign this and I'll get a percentage and I'll do this. And I had Bam Bam and you write that. Da, 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 da. And that's how it started, man. Wow. So but here's here, dude, I, I, I'll talk I'll, with me. You'll never have to talk. Listen, bro. <laughs> here's the funny thing is though, you're probably going to say this. Here's the funny thing. I'm in wrestling school, maybe, maybe three, four months, maybe in that time, I probably go to class three or four times. The other times I'm just in bars, getting drunk, being me, <laughs> doing my thing. 
I'm not even going to this thing. I was just, Larry Sharp had me drinking Seagram Sevens and Rolling Rock. Oh, boy. Rolling Rock, because we represent New Jersey. Yeah. Jerry the King. Now, I now mind you, I haven't learned anything, anything. I know how to do it. I know how to lock up, and I know how to do a drop-down toe hold for some reason. I can throw a punch and kick. That's all I know. That's all I know. Jerry Lawler comes in and sees, oh, gee, he, Jerry hears about me. Jerry Lawler comes in, hires me. Next thing I know, I'm fucking going to Memphis. My very first match ever, ever. I don't mean no warm up match. I don't need no practice match. I mean, first time I'm in an actual match is in Memphis, Tennessee on a Monday night against Jerry the King Lawler in the main event. That's my very first match, not knowing anything. Wow. I mean, that is a huge deal for people that don't know. I mean, Lawler himself, you know, is a legend in the business, but then you add in Lawler and Memphis Ooh. Monday night. That's, that's some elite people have no idea. right there. Yeah. People, if, if you're not a fan of the sport of wrestling, that might kind of not resonate with you like it should, but that holds a lot of weight there. Now you went over in that match, right? He put you over. Yeah. It's, that's wow. another thing is people don't realize that from Hulk Hogan to the rock, to the undertaker, to stone cold, everybody has gone through Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler has been the start of just about every major and minor and in between superstar, you know, they went through Memphis and Jerry Lawler. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I, there's not a name you can tell me that didn't go through there. Yeah. He was a mainstay in the business, man. Like you said, for that to be your first match, what, how was the nerves in you at that time? Was it, was it pretty nerve wracking or were you pretty relaxed? I, I don't that? remember. I've never been one to be real nervous. That's probably one of my biggest downfalls is I'm not nervous, but, uh, I, I can't remember. I don't remember being nervous. I just remember I remember Jerry Lawler saying, just listen to me, kid, and I'll get you through it. Do everything I tell you to do. And we went out a little bit early and got in the ring. And he, we did it like we were in the ring for like five minutes. He goes, oh, you'll be all right. Just do what I tell you to do. Wow. Now you were, what was it? The soul taker? That's what you were down there? The soul taker. Yes. That's that's pretty close to a, a guy named Mark Calloway's name that he would get later on, The Undertaker. Yeah. Well, that wasn't that wasn't any correlation at that time. No, 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 no none at all. Because I think we, Brent, we uh, that's just before we met. Really? Okay, so y'all met down there. Now, did y'all? I think I've seen some pictures of you two together. Did y'all wrestle each other? Were y'all tags up? Or <laughs> we? He tells a funny story. He's been telling a story about that first. We had a match. Where, mind you, I'm used to dealing with these big old white racist biker dudes all my life and i've always been quick to hit i'm like dude i ain't gonna let this guy get off of me i'm gonna bust his ass before he busts me and that's how i always was i used to say when i went to, i'd be the only black dude at these biker function i said first person to mess with me i'm gonna knock him out and after that you watch nobody will mess with me and it was always like that you said i think i was the one that they said you know that well we just gonna leave that one alone <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, where, where were we going with this? Oh, uh, you and Taker's first time. In and the so the match we had, and my, Taker had been in the business a couple of years. You know how green I was. The match was so terrible, and not because of him, because of me, uh, that they made us a tag team. And uh, after that night, we became a tag team and, and became really, really, really good friends. What was the name? What was y'all's tag name? We were called Death Express. Death Express. Well, that sounds Death like Death Express. He was his name was Matt. His name was Master of Pain. Master of Pain. I was the soul taker. Cheers to Death Express. <laughs> here we go. I got oh, I don't got none in there. So hang on. Let me, uh -oh. I'm double dipping over here. You <laughs> I'm drinking uh, a Jack and Coke and taking shots. Yeah, well, I'm doing Jim Beam and my drink and then doing the shots. So. That's American. There you go. <laughs> now, are you a smoker? Cigarettes or your choice of stuff? <laughs> uh, I already that, that already gave me the answer right there. <laughs> I was like, uh, you don't mind if 
No, no. As go we ahead. talk, I take a couple. I got to stay medicated, brother. Yes, just... sir. No, no. Go right ahead. No, I've never been a cigarette smoker. That's just one thing that I've I've never done. So you're saying? Absolutely. <laughs> now, see, here in South Carolina, as we were talking earlier, that has not made its way to be legal yet. Now, if you're out in California, it is very legal out there, correct? I'm in Nevada. Oh, Nevada. Okay, okay. But it is legal in Nevada. It's legal in California. It's le legal in Arizona. Um, I think it's legal in Utah. <coughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not positive. It might be recreational. I mean, uh, medical. Medical, okay. I'm yeah. not sure. But Washington, uh, Oregon... I mean, everything out here, there's, Colorado, there's yeah. almost more legal states than the you know, South Carolina will be legal before. Oh you know yeah. It. It's, it's coming. It's coming. I've got, it's, a it's coming mine. everywhere. I've got a friend of mine. His name's uh Travis Postel and he opened up a chain out here called I heart CBD and man, he's got everything out there. He's got the CBDs. He's got the drops. He's got the gummies. He's got the flowers. It's, it's uh, it's really been popular. I remember he first he opened up one store. I remember when he first opened it up, and it's probably a year or two later, and he's got like six of them here. He's branched out. He's got some in Greenville. Uh, it's doing good things, man. It's it's definitely helping out a lot of people that I think beforehand, you know, maybe would try to keep it under wraps that they were doing it, or you know, now it's they're doing it for like you said, medical reasons. I mean, the CBD helping with the joints and stuff like that. It's it's oh, really bro. helping out people. Um, I know it helps a lot of people. I, I think my my THC level of tolerance level is so high that it doesn't work real well with me. Right. But like my wife who doesn't smoke, she'll do some Delta 8 and take a little hit off a pen or take some tinctures or right. and she's just feeling great. So, I mean, it does work for people. Right. I think if you're not a real heavy duty <laughs> toker smoker of the smoke train like me, Right. I think it can work for you. I think it's a great thing. I, did, I I'm glad that people are getting benefit from it because yeah. brother, there's so much more to it than getting high, getting high as a, as a plus. Right. But I mean, at 27 years old, I'm Papa Shango, right? Yeah. I'm thinking Vicodins, Vicoprofen, Somas, Halcyons, Placidils, Percocets. I don't know if I said Halcyons. I'm taking all this shit and then drinking a bottle of Jack every day, but I ain't going to try. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to smoke. I tried smoking at 27 years old. I was Papa Shango for the first time in my life. Now, will I drink still? Yeah, I'll still drink, but I don't take any pain medication whatsoever beyond the Advil or a Lee. I, I take none, none of that stuff. And so much of that stuff, when you see so many people my age, dying and all of us are dying over these things is because the boys don't let go of what they're doing right. and marijuana cannabis took me off of all of that i mean i'm 60 years old now and i mean i'm still going strong brother i see that and I mean, <laughs> it's it's definitely i think becoming more open and socially acceptable you know especially around here you know it's the deep south so you're, you're right along the bible belt you're going to have people that's going to fight that stuff but like my dad had a stroke probably it's probably been about 12 years ago now. And, you know, he still got a limited use of his left side. And he told me mm. not too long ago, he said, I tried some of that CBD stuff. And he said, damn, if I don't feel a whole hell of a lot better. There you so, go. I mean, it's just, it's definitely beneficial. And like you said, the high is the plus, but it's a lot of medical benefits to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why it's good that they have Delta 8, Delta 9 CBD, because a lot of people don't want that high. Right. Okay. But you want the effects, uh, uh, you know, of the medicine inside that plant, you know, right. and the CBD and uh, you don't, I mean, you don't, you don't need to get high. It's, yeah. There's a lot of benefit to that plant. A lot of benefit to that plant. I yeah. just, I just, I just chose to choose to take the whole plant. <laughs> <laughs> now, while we're on this subject, I was going to get to it a little bit later, but since we kind of segued over here to the cannabis side, you actually have, your own strain of cannabis is that right yes i do yes oh since you mentioned it it's with uh it's called insane let me see if i get it right in the shot it's called go. insane godfather last little cadillac on the back <laughs> let me see let me see let's see i can't see it tested 37 percent wow 
no, wait, I'm sorry. That's in Canada. It's 32%, 32.8%. It's a hybrid, but uh, indica hybrid, but it's very good. It's sold at Dr. Green Thumb. It's only sold in California. That's the problem. And because right. it's on the, I'm on the legal side. I'm not on the illegal side. Mm -hmm. And so you can only sell it where it's grown. So right now it's only grown in California and it's at seven or eight different dispensaries in California, Dr. Green Thumbs. The insane brand is his own personal premium brand and it's the fire bro believe me it's the fire so if you guys are in california you can't order it through mail i can't send it to you but uh it it's it'll be branching out as he branches out more so will the brand now you say he that's actually be real right from cypress yes. Hill, that's who's running mm -hmm. okay yeah all right yeah well if, i mean if anybody remembers those songs from back in the day what hits from the bong and everything else you know, <laughs> he's got some of the best smoking songs out I there i ain't lying that's probably what, when, when i think smoking that's exactly what i got that and probably some bone thugs and harmonies that you, you, yeah yeah. East. yeah yes sir smoke with all them guys <laughs> <laughs> So you, you mentioned earlier, you done it when you were with Papa Shango. Now, when you, you were soul taker down there in the, or the, what territory was that when you were soul taker? Was that, uh, that was Memphis. You, it wasn't USW. It was called uh, mid South Mid South. Okay. So when did New York come a call and when did you kind of make that transition up to Vince and those guys? Well, me and taker were always like, once we became friends, we became uh, really good friends. Right. And, and to this day, I'm telling you, man, and you, it's coming out more and more that he's talking. I, I love that dude. He is probably not one of my best wrestling friends. He's, he's a bro of mine, man. Yeah. And, uh, he, he's just a really good dude. But uh, I, I start, I, I got to watch what I say about him. <laughs> Cause I get him in trouble. <laughs> but let's see, once again, what was the question? Oh, just how did you get in touch with uh, Vince or how did, how did that transition? So I was following with Mark. And York? so uh, when we became a tag team, Mark went to Japan. When he came back, I went to Japan. Right. Okay. When I came back, he went to WCW. I He went to WCW as Mean Mark, mean I think. Mark, mean Mark yeah. Callis. Callis. Okay. Callis. When he went, to w, he went to WCW, I went to Germany for seven months and worked for a guy named Otto Vons. And I don't know if you've heard of Otto Vons. I've heard that name, yeah. But he's the Jerry Lawler of Germany. Right. And let me tell you, this was on the card. And see, what you do is you'd go to, it's between Austria and Germany, but mostly Germany. And you'd be in, you'd be out there for seven, eight months, and they pay you well. But listen who was on the card when I was there, who was there with me. Scott Hall, Fit Finley, Dave Taylor, Chris Benoit, Owen Hart, uh, uh, Salvatore Balombo, uh, uh, PM News, uh, 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 Rambo, who came in, to, I forgot what his name is, but those are the guys that were on the card and you stayed in the trailer, you'd be the same, like you'd be in Hanover, Dortmund, Bremen, Dusseldorf, you'd be in these towns for 30 days in a row and you'd stay in a trailer outside, right outside the building, you have your trailer like a <laughs> carnival, you follow the Oktoberfest. Yeah. It was crazy, bro. And so when I got back from Germany, Taker was in the WWE. So I got a tryout in the WWE in Arizona and they hired me. And Vince says, we're going to hire you. He says, I'm going to put you on payroll because I want you to go home and keep doing what you're doing. He says, but he goes, you got a body of a monster. He says, but you got a baby face. He goes, I got to come up with something to, cause I don't want a baby face. I want to heal. Right. He says, I've got to do something with your face. Hence Papa Shango. Wow. Now the and you can you can confirm or deny this, but kind of the backstory or the the origin for that wasn't that a Bond villain? Oh yeah. yeah. Vince himself called me, and uh, I was at the club, and the doorman, his name was Abdullah the Butcher. Abdullah oh. goes, "Hey, Abdullah goes, hey, Vince McMahon's on the phone." I'm like, "Yeah, right." So I pick up the phone. Yeah, what's up? He goes, "Girls, hello. This is Vince McMahon." And I'm like, oh shit, this is him. This is exactly, I, I can remember this like it was yesterday. And I'm at the bar, right? And he goes, Charles, I want you to go rent the movie, Live and Let Die. And I already knew the movie. He goes, there's a voodoo character in there and we're going to take off after him. So I want you to watch the movie and give me a call. And I, you know? <laughs> yeah. A pretty good impersonation there, man. And that's where, if you watch the movie, the black guy that played, his actual name was Baron Samidi, or Baron Samadai. Um, 
that was in the the the, the, the my character's real name is Baron Samadai. It's either Samidi or Samadai. I think it's Samadai. And so uh, he was also, and you're probably too young to remember this, but Seven Up, he was the Uncola guy, and he had that laugh. <laughs> <laughs> He, he had that uncultural laugh, and that's where I stole the laugh from. Wow. Now, back in those days, I mean, I was a, I was a fan, you know, during that time. Obviously, Hogan was kind of like your number one baby face. But I remember as a kid, there weren't very many people in wrestling because of, you know, you had some more cartoonish gimmicks at the time. Like but mine. You, but you and Taker, as a kid... That was pretty damn creepy. That scared the hell out of me. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> I mean, other yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I had parents at uh, the buildings protesting me, telling, telling the WWE that they didn't want me in their town because their kids couldn't sleep at night thinking Papa Shango was going to come get them. <laughs> well, I was, tell, I was, I told Vince, I wouldn't fuck with kids. I would tell kids, you will not dream of the ocean. You will dream of Papa Shango and you will dream of death. <laughs> oh man, that's classic right there. I know you had to have fun with that gimmick. I mean I, I had fun with it, but I, I was it was I was I gotta be careful. My wife, I don't know if she's listening or not, but uh, I was going through a really bad divorce when I was Papa Shango. Okay. And it made me a really mean mean person yeah and it came to the point because of what she was doing to me on the road that uh, me vince and undertaker thought it would be best if i went home and got my head straight right before i hurt somebody and oh. that's what happened to papa shango it wasn't vince it wasn't this it wasn't the wrestlemania that i was late for it wasn't none of that it was me and I was in a bad, bad place. And like I said, back then I'm taking pills. And I mean, uh, you wouldn't know about this because there was no internet back then. There was no right. social media, dude. I'm getting in a fight every night. I'm beating people up in bars and takers, takers pulling me off. Taker and Ron Simmons and Bradshaw are pulling me off of people every night to where yeah. taker had to go out with me every night just to keep an eye on me. <laughs> yeah. I was in a bad place. Wow. Now, now you mentioned uh, yeah. it, you glossed over the uh, the late WrestleMania deal. Now, from what I understand, I've heard, you weren't exactly late. Somebody else kind of dropped the ball on that, which sent you out late. It wasn't you. The, the agent in charge, they were worried because I was so green and I was involved in such a big moment. Uh, they said, do not go until we tell you to go. Now, all I have to, all I, this is all I remember, this is a long time ago. All I remember is what I had to do when I got there. That's all I was concerned is with, I got there, this is what I was supposed to do. And that's one time when I was a little nervous because of the people that you're involved with. Right. So I'm sitting at the curtain, like a track guy, get ready to like a superhero or a track guy, get ready to come out the curtain. I'm just standing. I'm not watching the monitors. I'm not watching anything. I know when they tell me to go, I'm going to take off on a sprint, do what I have to do. Well, what happened is they sent me late because they're not used to sending people and they were probably watching. They said, Oh shit, go, go. Oh shit, go, go. You're late. And that's what happened. So you were, and I'm not going to bury, I'm not going to bury, I'm not going to bury the person that did it. Right. But here's the weird, here's the funny thing, bro. When I got there, I did what I had to do. I didn't know who had to kick out of a finish or anything. Okay. But when I got back, nobody ever said anything to me. I never heard a word about it until years later and i'm signing autographs at these conventions and people are asking me what happened i'm like what the fuck do you mean what happened They're like you were late for the thing you kicked out i'm like what are you talking about and the reason it was never brought to my attention because it wasn't my fault right and so the person who screwed up he stepped up and said hey i sent him late and so i never oh no be I got to go out of the picture one second. I got to grab a couple of things. You, you talk to me while I do it. My, my, my refrigerator is right here, so I don't go far. <laughs> but I can't keep putting... I can't keep putting Undertaker's special blended Dead Man Eat. Let me see if we can see this. I can't keep putting... Can you see it or no? Yeah, it's kind yeah, of hard. It, yeah. 
Right, there you go. I can't keep putting that in my drinks because that's just sacrilegious. That's that's this this is what belongs in there. Special occasional sipping. There. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with Jack Black, but that that's what you mix Jack and Coke with, not yeah. not taker. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> single. I don't know. Single barrels the best whiskey that Jack makes. They make Jack Daniels number seven. Yeah. They make Gentleman Jack that's over there, and then of course they make single barrel. Then they make aged single barrel. And yeah. this doesn't say how aged it is. Let me shut my door here. It doesn't say how aged it is, but it's aged because it's really smooth. It is smooth. Though. You get all type of lessons when you talk to the Godfather. <laughs> I've actually I haven't never tried the Gentleman Jack. Um, it's good. My next one, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a shot to. It's it's a little cheaper than uh, single barrel, but it's really good. See, look at now you take a shot. That makes me look oh, bad when you take oh, a shot. I don't... Already. What, what? <laughs> All right, let me let me take a shot of Jack with you since we're talking. There we go. You're not gonna tell nobody, are you? No, I'm not. Not a soul. Because you know, I I don't drink. <laughs> you you can't drink. drink. What was that? Well, how do you say that? You never say you don't drink. You just said you can't. Or I know. Say I say. You just say you don't. <laughs> what I say is I never say I can't drink. I just say I choose not to drink. There you go. <laughs> but I never said that I can't. It ain't nothing to be proud about, you know. I'd rather be proud about smoking than drinking. Right. Uh, drinking is one of those things, man, depending on what we're doing, like we're doing these podcasts or whatever, you know, do a couple of these. It kind of just takes the edge off and, you know, puts me at ease and, Especially, I'm a welder by trade. That's my day job. So you spend all day up under a hood and sweating. Running them beads. Yeah, running them beads and, you know, laying the welds in there. You know, come home, kick back, make yourself a drink. Just kind of unwind from the day. That's how I like to do it. Man, ain't nothing wrong with that, brother. I'm right with you. Nothing wrong with that. Now, you were talking about uh, your, your ending there with Papa Shango and you went away. Real quick before we get into you coming back as combo, there's a few things during that era. Like I said, as a kid, I was a huge fan. I watched all the time. It was probably Jake sticking the Cobra on Macho Man. Woo, I remember that. When Undertaker got put in the, or no, excuse me, when Warrior got put in the casket, when Undertaker put him in the casket. Uh huh. You remember that on the, on the funeral party? Yes. And then, when you put the spell on warrior, those three things stick out in my mind. I know a lot of people's had a lot of things to say, you know, about Jim, him being hard to work with in y'all's time running that angle. How, how did that go? Because that it went over very well, at least as a kid, I thought it went over very well. That angle was never designed to go long distance. That's what people don't know. What happened is he was supposed to run a program with Sid and Sid refused to do the job. So Sid quit. Okay. And so they had Warrior there. He had to and go play I, I, I know exactly how the meeting went. The meeting went like this. Who do we, when, when Sid quit, they said, who do we have to put, who's got any steam on him? And they said, only person with any steam is Papa Shango. So Papa Shango got fed to the ultimate warrior. He was, they were probably looking more to hook up a macho man thing. It right. was just a thing to do in between. So that's where, the business it gets you sometimes. Okay. I went from beating Tito Santana every night to going against the warrior. Right. And you kind of got fed to the warrior, but that's the business, bro. And yeah. you know, I am not mad at him to this day, to this day, I'm still under contract with the WWE. I'm under a legends contract. I did the net. I did the bump last week. I did two things on the network last week. Mm -hmm. They keep coming out with my action figures. They're super cool with me. I'm super cool with them. So I've always been business with them. I was never get butt hurt over what they did. I mean, right. never. Yeah, I and think my so, son's got your action figure. <laughs> huh? My son's got your action figure. He's yeah, I mean, them, dude, I got nothing but love for that whole family. They've been, Linda doesn't like me, but, <laughs> but everybody, Stephanie likes me and Shade likes me. But Linda don't like me, though. <laughs> Well, that, that don't have anything to do with the elevator story, does it? I heard a, I heard a funny story <laughs> about the elevator. I, want, I definitely want to get to that. Can you tell us a little bit about that elevator? And the, uh, the I was on a podcast with JBL and uh, Jerry Briscoe, and Jerry Briscoe was there, and he brought that up. And basically, 
one of the oh my god rest his soul uh i met this guy and I, I don't like hogan anyway so um hulk hogan's bud dealer at the time was named fast freddy and um i met him when undertaker was doing the movie what was that movie called suburban, suburban commando. commando well he was the bounty and yeah. and, and I, that's when i was in a really bad place takers like hey bro come out here i'm shooting a movie come hang out with me we'll put you up in a nice hotel just get your mind right. So I jumped on my Harley and I, it's only like three and a half hours to LA and I went to LA and I met big worm. <laughs> but, uh, fuck, I, it's, I lose track because I start thinking about things, but where was it? Oh, the, the, the elevator with the smoke. So, London. <laughs> so now, now Freddie, because of Hogan's already kind of opened up the door for him with people, but Hogan kind of turned his back on him. And then, uh, when I met him, I kind of got back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's just i love that dude so much and so once again i forgot <laughs> the the so, yeah, I, I, that's because i start thinking oh. ahead about freddie man he's dead now so we're in california my hometown we're in san jose we're at the marriott hotel we're up in my room smoking and we go down dude we're going out to the lobby now back then mind you there's no social media yeah. there's no cell phones there's nobody taking pictures of you. There's nobody, re there's not even an ESPN. So we're smoking in the elevator, right? Me and Freddie, all of us, we're just clam, we call it clam bacon. We're just filling this elevator. So the elevator gets down to the bottom floor. It opens up. It's like a Cheech and Chong movie. All the smoke coming out. <laughs> and there's Vince, there's Linda, there's Stephanie, there's Shane, there's Jerry Briscoe. And they just look at me and it's just smoke coming out of the elevator. And Vince looks at me and goes, Charles, I think we'll take the next elevator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, that's a true story, man. I can, I can hear Bruce. I listened to that something to wrestle podcast and Bruce uh, Pritchard's uh, when he talks like this. Goddamn, pal. I can just hear that when that elevator opens up and that smoke comes pouring out. <laughs> Oh, uh, I've spent a lot of time with Bruce. I'm surprised he don't tell some stories about me. <laughs> he does. He's pretty open about, uh, you know, his choice of the, uh, the herbal. He ain't no smoker. <laughs> He's a part-time smoker. Part -time Every smoker. time he smokes with me, it ends up bad for him. <laughs> um, so we'll step back here. You came back for a stint as Kama Mustafa. Was it just time? Were you ready to come back and give it another go there? Yeah. <laughs> So you don't know the story, do you? Uh uh. This interview ended up being about five hours long if you don't be careful. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Um, I was to come back as Papa Shango. Okay. See, I thought that and was later. I thought that was nope, your third term. Nope. Okay. No, not not if you're talking about Kama Mustafa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not Kama, Kama Mustafa. You're well, talking yeah, about. Yeah. Okay. I I misspoke. I was talking about Kama. Kama, the supreme fighting machine. Kama is when I was sitting at home after Papa Shango, and I'm. I got, like I said, I always had the strip clubs. So I was always had a ways of make, making money. I didn't need wrestling to make money. Right. And wrestling for me was more fun. So they would call me and say, you ready to come back? And I say, no. And they'd say, we got this idea. And I say, no, we got this idea. And I say, no. And they said, Hey, we got this thing. There's this thing called ultimate UFC. There's this guy named chemo. That's kind of over. He's got tattoos and we kind of want to do that kind of thing with you and call you comma, kick any man's ass. And I'm like, nah, I ain't interested. They said, we'll let you ride a Harley. And I'm like, oh, you let me ride a Harley? Oh, shit. I'm like, I'm in. And that's what, and so I came back into him. It didn't go well. I wasn't happy. The Harley was hard because at that time, Vince didn't own a bunch of Harleys like he did later with Undertaker's bikes and DOA. And so you had to rely on what people brought in. And people were bringing in sportsters and girls' bikes. So they took the bike away from me. Once they took the bike away from me, I was ready to go. Yeah. Now, and so things didn't go comma for comma. Things didn't go well, because like I said, I, I, I wasn't happy. I wanted to go home. Were, and I, I remember it, but I can't remember if that was comma or comma Mustafa. Was it comma where you melted down the undertaker's urn and put it into <laughs> a necklace? Oh my God. Yeah, that was, I've been in more goddamn <laughs> coffins. I've been in coffins as Papa Chango, comma, <laughs> good father. Fuck it, probably somebody else in there between probably Kama Mustafa too. I've been in so many damn caskets. When I'm when I die, they ain't put me in no casket. 
damn. What was that a comma stint or was that comma Mustafa when you did that? That that did what? That melted down Undertaker's chain. That was comma uh, the fighting machine that did that. I stole his urn, made it a yeah. chain. Made it into yeah. a chain. I remember. And then that. They, my my newest that my latest action figure is comma with that chain on it. Is it? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so when you come back. That's when you say you can pick up on that story. Now you're supposed to be bringing back as Papa Shango kind of, you know, revised a little bit, a little bit more serious, right? I'm not going to be casting spells. It's going to be more about wrestling, right? Uh, it's going to be dark side stuff, but much more about wrestling than putting spells on people. Right. And uh, I, this is a true story, bro. And you know me, I'm medicated all the time. And the whole time I was in the WWE, I was medicated. <laughs> and um, I show up, I'm in a good mood. They say, Vince wants to talk to you. I'm like, cool. I like Vince. I want to talk to Vince. So I'm like, what's up, Vince? He goes, Charles, change the plans. I'm like, change the plans. He goes, we're going to call you Kama Mustafa. He goes, you and Farouk are going to wrestle The Undertaker tonight. You're going to go over. And uh, we're going to put you in a group called The Nation of Domination. And you know what I said? Do I still get paid the same? He goes, of course, Charles will take care of you. I'm like, well, then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I get to beat the Undertaker tonight? Okay, yeah. Hell yeah, I'm in. Now I'm going to beat his, I'm going to pin him. I'm not even going to pull his leg up. I'm just going to put my hands on his chest and shit. <laughs> Did he tell you who all was going to be in there? Because that's a, that's a big name group, man, of guys. Um, I read the careers. I met Ron Simmons right that day. I knew who Ron Simmons was. I followed his football career. Right. He's just a little older than me. Florida State. Alone. And uh, I knew who he was. So I went to Ron and I'm like, dude, what's up? He's like, man, man, I don't know what's up. He goes, man, I, they ain't tell me shit. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, all right. So I went home and then the next week at TV, Vince pulled me and Ron into the office. And he says, you, you guys know who Dwayne Johnson is? And I didn't know. Who Johnson was. I'm like, nah, I don't know who the fuck that is. And Ron's like, yeah, they're they Rocky my <laughs> I always got to talk like Ron when I talk. <laughs> and so uh, uh, he goes, well, listen, he goes, I'm not going to say exactly what he said, but he said uh, he tried to make him one way and people shit on it. He goes, I'm going to make him a different way this time. I need y'all's help. And he goes, once I, with your help, I get this kid over. He goes, when I switch him, he's going to be the, this is what Vince said. He goes, and I don't know if Vince says this with everybody, but he said it to me and Ron. He goes, when I get this kid over, when I switch him, when I turn him, he's going to be the biggest thing wrestling's ever seen. He goes, I need your help doing this. And then he laid it out for me and Ron right then. D'Lo, Ahmed Johnson, who didn't work out, Mark Henry, he laid it all out what we were doing and to where we were going to get to where we knew that I knew at the end of this run, when me and D'Lo were just walking to the ring, me, D'Lo and Mark Henry were just walking to the ring with, with the rock that I had to develop some type of new character. Right. And, and that's how that went. That's, I mean, y'all definitely, everybody in there kind of had great, I mean, Ron, obviously, you know, was kind of coming dwindling down, but even him, you know, hooking up with the APA, you going on to become the Godfather. Rock, obviously, you know, his speaks for itself. Mark Henry. Henry sexual chocolate. D Lo had a D -Lo, good two time champion there. I think he was holding yeah. two belts for a minute. Um, you know, that group had a lot of success after the fact. Let me ask you a question. Uh huh. Go ahead. Do you think the nation of domination will ever become get in the Hall of Fame? They should. What's holding it up, you then? I I do not have an answer for it other than the fact that today's time. No, 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 no. People, the rock. The, oh. the rock. How are you going to put the nation in the, in the hall of fame when the rock ain't in the hall of you fame? You don't think he would come back if they wanted to put him in the hall of fame. You don't think he would do that. I, it's not what I think. Has it happened? Well, no, it hasn't happened. Well, then that, that what do you think? I, that's not what I think. You know, why isn't he in the Hall of Fame already? That's a good question. I mean, I I have I, I, I don't have the answer, bro. I was thinking what my answer, what 
if I were to answer it, it would be because he probably wants <laughs> a lot of money to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. That would be my clue. Well, he's got enough money. <laughs> Yeah. He's sitting on enough. I mean, he just bought the damn I, I, XFL. I of, I'm not one of these people, but I know a lot of people with a lot, a lot of money. And this is what they tell me. I'm set up. I have my kids set up and I'm working on setting up their kids. Right. And that's the, what I get to the response of what's enough money. If you're talking about generational money and they're, they're trying to set up generations of wealth. Right. Well, he's well on his way, and I hope that at some point in time, the nation does get inducted because, like I said, as we spoke, I mean, you look at factions that's been inducted, the NWO, DX, uh, you know, free, I don't know, the free birds in there? Uh, yeah, they, that, uh, they went in the year that I went in, I think, okay, 2016, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, all those groups who's, you know, individuals went on to have great careers now i mean that's y'all are right up there man i mean without a doubt so it's well like i said they, they're gonna have to decide what they they're gonna have the rock what they're gonna do with the rock before you do that but i sooner or later you'll see us in there but like i said the rock's the hold up i i thought he was supposed to Look, i, I want to show you something gonna show up Just so people know people don't think i can grow here but, but let me show you i'm gonna take my hat off since we've been talking Real quick, my son had a, I'm going to turn around. My son told me, you're too old. You can't grow hair. <laughs> you can't grow no Afro. And so I think I'm going to grow an Afro just to mess with my son. Go ahead and do it. And I said, oh, shit, I can grow hair. I just, I choose to be bald. <laughs> That's a lot, a lot easier to maintain probably. Huh? Yeah. Well, not really. You got to shave it every day. Yeah, to keep it smooth. Um, I, yeah, my hairline's going back pretty far. I usually stay with a ball cap on. It's uh, <laughs> just one of them, I guess, bad genes the old man passed down on me. I started losing my hair early, man, real early. How about gray? Uh, not not gray, not gray. I got man, my thick. A lot of people ask me, do I dye my beard? I don't dye my beard. It's just naturally this black. I ain't gonna lie, I dye mine. Yeah. I dye mine because mine turns kind of whitish a little bit. And then I'm so light skinned that you can't see it. Yeah. But hey, I ain't dyed in a couple of weeks. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> um, when you were doing your nation stuff there, I mean, that, it looked like you guys were having a ball. Was that a pretty good time in the business for you? Were you enjoying that? <laughs> Brother, we had so much heat on us. And it, 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 I, I don't remember nobody calling us the N word or none of that shit, but we had so much heat on us. It was just fun to walk into a building and have people hate you as much as they hated us. To me, that was just cool and shit. I loved it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, let me ask you a question. I like to ask questions. Go ahead. If you did the nation today with the same people, then it doesn't even matter the same people. What's the the Hurt Company or whatever the WWF, WWE? What is the Hurt? What the, what are they called the Hurt something? The Hurt business? Which one? The new one? Yeah, I think it is Hurt. Well, with uh, with MVP and he was yeah. like the manager. And... Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Forget about that. If you did a modern day nation of domination would they be baby faces or heels man i would have you got to go heels i don't think i think they'd be baby faces really the way society is today well, yeah, yeah, they yeah, would be right. baby faces and i think dx would be heels could you imagine dx coming out today and in, in blackface and making a thing of the nation never happened not in a million fucking years I mean, I was lucky enough. Like I said, I was a fan from young, but then when I was a teenager, the attitude era was red hot and watching all the shit that you guys did during that era. I mean, that'll, ne I tell my son all the time, he got into wrestling a little bit older or younger, you know? And I said, man, you got no idea how much fun wrestling was to watch in that attitude era. Like you'll never see that shit again. I mean, every week, you know, titties popping out. It was crazy. 
But you know what, bro? What was cool? It wasn't just the main event. It was every match. Yeah, the whole car. From the be- start of the show to the end, every match had an angle. Every match mattered. You're you're right. You're right. You didn't you didn't go away. None of that was well, two hours, and I think you went to three. And I mean, no, we we, were, we never went to three back then. We were only two. That three is too much. Yeah. I I don't watch now, but it's because it's wrestling. It just takes too long. And WWE, and I love the death, and I ain't here to shit talk WWE by no means. But I mean, I watch three hours, and you see four matches. Yeah. Now, it might have been like that back when we were doing it, but at least we showed you some entertaining shit. Yeah. Oh, God, man. The entertainment factor. I mean, like you said, you had all your factions. You had the DX. You had the Nation. You know, y'all's going back and forth. You had Stone Cold. You had The Rock. I mean, Rock. You know. I mean, I mean if, we, if you really think about it, you can go on further and further. Which yeah. is The very it's first totally. match was might have been Brooklyn Brawler against Doink the Clown. But it had relevance and it had stuff that people talked about. And you, yeah. and you knew the angle. How about to the Attitude Era? Uh, to the Attitude Era. People always, I don't, uh, and this is nothing against wrestling. I love the business. I respect the business. The business has made me a lot of money and still does. But I don't watch. And it's just because I don't watch any TV. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, this is my office. Here's my TV. It's not even on. <laughs> I just don't watch TV. And so it's hard to sit down and watch wrestling for three hours when I don't watch TV. I just, I don't, nothing against TV. I just don't, I might watch, I don't like Stephen A. I like the skit, but, yeah. uh, and, and Shannon, but I, I might watch that a little more. I, I refuse to watch the news. I refuse. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care what side you're on. They're both bullshit yeah, on TV. Know. If you want to find out about the news, read about it, but yeah, I don't, want um, to. you know, no, it's just depressing. And I'll watch, I'm, I'm subscriber to the, the Peacock network. I'll watch the pay-per-views sometimes if it's a, a match or two, I want to watch, but it's, I'll be honest with you. I mean, uh, probably a part of it's, you know, I'm later on in life and I got a lot of other shit going on, but there's just not a lot of stuff that grabs me. Like even the guys that, you know, I found entertaining, they've let go. I was, I thought Bray Wyatt was probably the closest thing they had to a undertaker like character in a while uh, i was really impressed with how they were spending that whole wyatt thing and then he went to the fiend and then they let him go just recently my thoughts you want to know yeah absolutely this is what i always told people no matter how talented you are there probably could have been 20 rods mm-hmm. but he was the one that was chosen to that position and he did a good job you know there's a lot of talent out there. There can only be so many Undertakers. There can only be so many Shawn Michaels. There can only be so many Bret Hart's. There can only be so many Hardy Boys. You can only have so many of these tag teams, even though you have enough talent that you could have him and other people to fill a role. Maybe you're not, maybe wrestling has changed and it's more spots and high spots and this and that. Mm-hmm. And that really big giant guy doesn't have as much place as he used to have. And you're paying this big giant guy millions of dollars a year. And uh, I know that I'm sorry to see anybody let go with the WWE, but they got a lot of people. They're paying a lot of talent that ain't working. Yeah. No, you're, you're spot on with that. I haven't really they're thought paying of paying a that lot way. of talent that they ain't using. And they're not using them because you can only have so many of these you can't have five undertakers you right. can't have i mean you can barely have an undertaker in a cane yeah okay you can only have so many of these these gimmicks and the Shawn michaels the cm punks or whatever there's only so many spots even though there's a lot of people that can do these spots there's only so many spots so how long are you going to pay this guy $3 million a year. I don't know how much he makes, but just how long are you going to pay this guy $3 million a year when you ain't using them and you don't have no plans for them? It's right. better to let them go. And, and I'll be honest with you, the creativity they had with 
the Fiend character, whenever they come back, it felt like they hyped it up really well, but then he got beat like almost every time he got in the ring. So it's, you, you spend all this time hyping somebody for them to just put other people over it just, and it wasn't something, people that something, needed to go over something down the road. Didn't figure out for him. Yeah. I, I hey, know. wrestling ain't a fair business, bro. Oh yeah. It ain't fair. It ain't fair. And the best, the most talented people might not ever be noticed, but you got to remember it's a business. Business. It's a business. And even though I am to this day, really good friends with Vince and Shane and other, it's a business. And even though back in the day, we used to go to with Vince used to go to strip clubs with us and stuff. (laughs) You can't forget he's your boss and it's a business i've always taken thing on the business end now what well, well since you brought that up i'm curious when y'all go out to a strip club and vince is there is vince picking up the check is is he throwing some money around How, how's that going down <laughs> well, let me tell you something uh and the group that and me and vince and taker and macho man and a lot of us used to go out god bless i love macho man bro I love that motherfucker. I miss him so much. We spent, and Kurt Henning, and we spent a lot of times in titty bars. And I will say this, they all made a lot more money than me, so I never picked up no goddamn checks. <laughs> Fuck it. All of them made a lot more money than me. <laughs> I can imagine with the uh, the money in there that was flying around with those names you just named off. It was probably some good times had and, and some strip clubs around there. I would imagine. Um, I, I, I've always, I've since 82, 83, I've always worked in strip clubs. So yeah. I, I just said, I knew how to uh, communicate with the employees. Right. And, and uh, I just, I had a way with the employees that was beneficial to the WWE (laughs) and the people that hung out with us. You know, some people like they'll, they'll collect refrigerator magnets or I've seen some people do spoons and stuff, just a a memento from a different state. They visit. I try to visit a strip club. Anytime I go to another state, whatever (laughs) town I'm at, that's my, that's my goal is to eventually hit one in all 50 states before I die. That's my goal. (laughs) Well, see, you're a young man. That's good. But to yeah. this day, you couldn't pay me to go and do a strip club. Really? Mm. Hang on. Let me do this real quick. Go Keep ahead. talking. Yeah, tug it up. So you just kind of, you run your course with that or? Bro, I've been there, done that. I'm so tired of hoes, bro. I'm, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm, excuse me. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> I'm so tired of dealing with these girls, bro. I've been dealing with these girls. I know you're laughing, but I've been dealing with these girls since like 83, whole time of wrestling. And the mentality has changed. The girls have changed. Social media has changed the business. Man, pimping ain't easy, bro. <laughs> pimping, pimping ain't easy, especially. So I'm, more, I'm out of that business completely. I ain't got no, well, I'm gonna get myself in trouble. I'm out of that business completely. And uh, I'm more on the smoke train right now and staying high, having fun. And I'm like, uh, I'm like two years from, I'm 60 years old. I always like to say that. People are like, why do you always tell how old you are? I'm like, dude, I'm proud of how old I am. I'm go. 60 years old. I'm about ready to retire. So I'm just on the smoke train having a lot of fun. Hey, ain't, not, ain't a thing in the world wrong with that. Now, speaking of the hose, we're fixing to get into you becoming the godfather because we're we're coming close to the end of the interview but real quick i want to gloss you mentioned earlier bsk now for those that don't know that's bone street crew is that correct mm-hmm. now that was who was who was all in the bone street crew okay let me see if i get this right every time i do this somebody calls me and says you forgot about me <laughs> let's get managers out of the way first paul bear paul masa fuji Mm-hmm. wrestlers god rest his soul yokozuna right. crush savio vega henry godwin um midian taker me fatu 
Savio Vega. And what that is, that was our crew. That was our crew that played dominoes. That's our crew that rode together in two or three cars. That is our crew that went together, watch each other's back at night. That's our crew that just took care of business. That's our crew that played dominoes. Now, did you guys, I know people, you know, they knew BSK and they knew the click. Did you guys have any backstage heat or did everybody really oh, kind of get along? Well, first of all, with the people that I just mentioned, I, I just mentioned me, Undertake, me, Yokozuna, and Fatu, or Rikishi. Yeah. Savio, dude, our click would have beat any other click's ass in real life in seconds. It, they would not even step to us. I, but it wasn't about that, bro. Right. I mean, I, I'm just as much, no, I shouldn't say that. I'm very friendly with Sean Diesel. I'm really good friends with Scott Hall. I'm really good friends with x -Pac. I'm really good friends with Billy Gunn. So, I mean, I was friendly with those guys. And I just talked to Billy Gunn. And I just talked to x -Pac. Not too long. I just seen Scott Hall a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, no, there was they were much more political behind the scenes kind of stab you in the back. We were more just old school BSK motherfucker guys that hung out together, watch each other's back and people didn't fuck with us, but no, there was no political, nothing. If it was, I didn't know about it. They were all cool with me. I mean, they were all cool with me and all of us. So if any BSK member says that I didn't know about it. <laughs> Well, I, I wanted to clear that up because I know a lot of people, you know, know the Undertaker. He has a BSK tattoo, right? On his was that on his stomach? Oh, so do I. You, you you do too. We all do. All of mine's you. on okay. my. I have a demon that has a fist down on the back of my back that BSK's on his hand. Yeah, where's Taker? Taker's is like a stomach. I think or yeah, I think his is across the stomach. BSK. So, we all had that. We all had BSK tattoos. Wow, that's cool, man. Um. Yeah, that's that's dope. So when you're when you're fixing to put this Godfather thing in line, that kind of comes about with you and JBL, right? Y'all kind of wrestling some matches and not getting the reaction you're wanting, and y'all kind of have that brainchild. Me and Bradshaw are wrestling. You know what popcorn match is, right? Yeah, after your intermission. Right after yeah. intermission, it's a match that nobody gives a shit about. Yeah, it's just to get people back in their seats slowly. Mm -hmm. And so I was common Mustafa. He was Bradshaw or where the hell he was. And me and Bradshaw, he's a rough and tough son of a bitch, man. Oh, yeah. Me yeah. and him would beat the, he would go over one night with his lariat and I'd go over one night with the, the, the whole train or the pimp drop. And we would beat the hell out of each other for 10 minutes and just, I mean, literally beat the hell out of each other and go drinking at night. So one day I said, Johnny, let's try something different. And it was me and my, the Godfathers, it, my wife, my wife is the whole creator of the Godfather. Everything that the Godfather is, besides the stupid shit that I did out there, was my wife. The hats, the jewelry, the costumes, everything was my wife. She had, we had a full-time jeweler making us jewelry. We had a, a seamstress making us outfits. We had an airbrusher that would do our things. And she took care of all I did was stay high and did my thing. <laughs> so when you guys first kind of brought that out, was the hose, when did the hose get brought in? Well, me and, like I said, me and Bradshaw were beating the hell out of each other for an hour, for 10 minutes. And I said, Johnny, let's try something different. Now I'm growing my hair. Mm -hmm. My hair is growing. My hair is getting kind of long. I got a little afro. Got your, you got braids too. There. And I just, I, I just came out and said, I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm a pimp. And people kind of laughed. I said, but what you don't know is right here in Louisville, Kentucky, man, they got some of the best holes ever born. <laughs> and then I would point to somebody and say, there's one of my old holes. And of course, you know, the people would pop. I say, there's one of my old holes. Then I'd pick somebody either fat or really old and say, well, she's a little older now, but that was one of my holes too. You know, <laughs> it ain't easy. Like you're laughing, people would eat. And so I would offer John, and we had no girls. Now, mind you, we're going 10, 12 minutes with no reaction, beating the shit out of each other for fun, for fun. And uh, I mean, with bruises every day, we're just beating the shit out of each other. And so we try this and we go 10 minutes, never touch each other. 
And at the end of the thing, I, I, I offered John the hose and he take, and people would start chanting, take the hose, take the hose. And I'm like, Johnny, they're telling you, I said, I'm, I said, it's my turn. I'm going to kick your ass tonight anyway. So take the hose. And so he would take the girls and he was, and there was no girls involved. I would say right now in the back in the limo, he would take the girls. He would start walking. That's our healing all the people. Just another dumb redneck falls from the bed. Da, 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 da. Right. So he would turn around. He'd come back to the ring. Referee would spin me around. I'd spin around. Johnny would hit me with that lariat. One, two, three. I'd pop up with my hat and shit and grab the mic and say, man, Pippin ain't easy. <laughs> Just how you laughed, that's how quick it got over to oh. where we did it one weekend and we went to TV and Vince went to me and said, Charles, I think whatever you're doing has legs. He goes, you think you can get me some girls? I'm like, Vince, are you joking me? <laughs> to me, Undertaker and the Harris twins, Ron and John Harris, they were in DOA, the twins. Yeah, yeah. Remember them? Yeah, we I'm went to a that. titty bar and got hosed. Me, Undertaker, and those two during the day went to a titty bar and got hosed and brought them back to the, and, and put them on TV. The night that we put them on TV, it was live Monday Night Raw. I'm on an airport Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm flying home where maybe every now and then somebody notices you to where everybody's like, Godfather, where's the hose? <laughs> That's how strong that TV was in that point. And from that point, I think Bruce Pritchard, we talked about Bruce Pritchard earlier. Mm -hmm. Bruce took over getting the hose, but it got over it got over so big that strip clubs used to call the WWE and say, you're going to be on January 2nd, you're going to be in here. We would love to supply the girls. And that's how it became. Well, yeah. so that, that was actually my next question. Did you, did they have a fee or were they just good enough to be on TV? And that was a, a square deal. I think they paid. I, I just call them what they are, man. I, and so it, if it ain't politically correct, I'm sorry, but I'm old school. Lib Ho's got $300 a night. Wow. And I would show up. There'd be at least six to eight hoes there. Yeah. And uh, depending on how much time I had, if I only had eight minutes, nine minutes, it would take so long to get the girls in the ring and get the girls out of the ring and have some sort of match right. and then bring the girls back in the ring. That, I mean, if you see me walk out with two girls, it was a quick match. <laughs> if you see me walk out with a, long, a lot of girls, it was a long match. Okay. <laughs> now, when did you start introducing your little phrase that you had in there? You go, go ahead and roll a fatty for this pimp daddy. When did that become a part of it? Was, was that from the beginning or did that come in a little bit later on? Bro, that was from the beginning. That was from the beginning. And I told Vince, even though Vince, and I don't want to get no heat with Vince, but Vince, you said, oh, I never, I told Vince, Vince, there is, I'm like, I bet you 80% of your audience smokes weed and nobody addresses it. I said, I mean, Vince knew I smoked. I mean, anyway, with me, ain't no hidden shit. Everybody knew I smoked. Yeah. And so uh, I said, let me go after the stoner crowd. I said, I guarantee you when I say roll a fatty for this pimp daddy, he says, well, a fatty could be a cigar too. I'm like, a fatty could be anything you want it to be. <laughs> and so I said, roll this fatty for this pimp daddy, like that blood up and say, and he was cool with it. I'm like, Vince, I'm like, I'm telling you, here's what people didn't know. When I do house shows, and I would say, roll up fatty for this pimp daddy. Light that blood up. All of a sudden, you would smell weed in the whole arena because people were taking one hit and going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And I used to tell other wrestlers, I'm like, watch what I say this. You'll smell weed. And they're like, damn, you're right, bro. <laughs> you know damn good and well that wouldn't fly today. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm before my time, brother. It still am. <laughs> You, you are, you are very much before your time with that one. Um, well, I, I take that back maybe because I, at, at the attitude era, you fit perfect. So yes. maybe if it would, uh, it might've been too much in the earlier era with your Hogan's and your machos. And it's definitely way too much now with all the censorship shit they had going on. So the Godfather character, I think was probably right where he was supposed to be at the time. I, I, I just. This, I, I don't shit, I, I call it poo-poo, I shouldn't say shit. 
I don't poop on any other generation. This is what I say. Right. I am so blessed, proud, happy to be part of the attitude error and a big part of the attitude error Huge. that I mean, that'll keep me going forever. I'm just blessed to be part of that, man. man. And I don't, other errors don't matter. Just to be part of that error, I was blessed. I know that had to be a fun time for you. And I know it probably had to suck just as much when they kind of took that away and made it the good father. That probably had just a, uh, you uh, just, you just had to fuck with my high. Didn't yeah. You? That I don't you even just want, had to bring that shit up. I don't even want to talk about that shit, man. We're gonna, I don't either. <laughs> I hated uh, that shit. Yeah. I, I can believe it. I can believe it. Cause that's like, like you said, even though it's a character in his own TV, that's close to the real you. So that had to be, well, NAR, no acne required. I mean, that was just fucking you just out there having you have, a ball. You just, <laughs> bro, I mean, you, you'll put me in a whole just downer mode talking about this shit. You have no idea. And, yeah. and, and this is, I always say on these podcasts, and I don't know if Stevie Richards ever hear it, but I've never been a bully. I've been somebody that is quick to hit, quick to fight, quick to defend but I've never been someone to start shit. And I started a lot of shit with uh, Stevie Richards. And uh, I was as much as a bully as you could be to him only because I blamed him from them taking the, I mean, bro, I was the godfather. Could I you know. imagine every day, every day, every day, girls were showing up to my hotel room we're smoking weed, we're drinking, we're partying, they're topless. And then a limo comes and picks us up and takes us to the building. And we do our thing. And we're, Godfather Gimmick got over so much that they put me on first just to start the show off right. So I would show up with all these hoes. They're all drunk, high, pilled up, showing their titties, all that type of stuff, right? I would go right into my match. As soon as my match is over, I'd tell the girls, see you later. Boom, I'm back. By the third match on TV, I'm in my hotel room smoking weed going, that's just cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> and to take that away from me was just, but they had to because they're going more PG. And so just to give you a little insight, when they made me the, the uh, good father, I tried to quit right away. But I'm a loyal dude. And Vince is like, come on, Charles. We're just going to run this out. We're going to do this. We're going to All right. And so I'm like, I kept saying, Vince, I'm done. And then what does he do? He drops the straps on me and Bull against the Hardy Boys. Because I'm loyal. Yeah. They've always been cool with me. So I'm cool with them. So that kept me there for like another three months. As soon as they took the straps off of us, I was done. Go. Oh. Wow. Yeah, that that had to be probably that was probably your hands your best time in the business those godfather years i would imagine that'd be hard to beat i would i would think brother it's a blessing to get paid the money that i got paid to be myself <laughs> <laughs> I would everything that i was saying on tv i would ron Simmons used to say Man, these motherfuckers don't know. You fooling all these motherfuckers. They don't know. They don't know. I know. This motherfucker here the big pimp in the world. <laughs> I think in my Hall of Fame speech, I said, even though I'm not a pimp, let me see. I own a strip club. I didn't own it. I was part of it. I, I, I have a strip club. I can send girls. I can do this. Well, let's leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do one more here to the godfather well wait 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 let me catch up shit okay, okay. i got some jack up we do shots of, i'll do this over here i'll do this there we go oh number seven all right there we go i got one ready now all right to the godfather pimping ain't easy pimping ain't easy man to everybody out there i love you guys man keep listening keep doing your thing um before we get out of here, man, I, I got a, a, just a few questions backstage out of the, out of the camera, you know, backstage when you guys are partying or whatever, who was outside of the BSK, who was guys that, you know, could handle their own that you did not want to fuck with. Who was, who was built like that? 
I, I what would do you mean? Probably Brad, what do you mean? Though. Didn't want to fuck with fighting or drinking? Yeah, yeah, fight. Yeah, fight. Brad, there were so many. That, that's. There were so many tough guys when I was there. I mean, there was 20 tough guys. Everybody was tough. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to shit talk today's business. But the guys, how do I say this politely? The guys today aren't the same guys that were 20 years ago. Right. And wrestling business has changed, which is cool. I'm cool with that. But the guys today probably would not survive with the guys of 20 years ago. <laughs> well, I know. But back, I mean, back in those days, they would kind of, you know, maybe not so much Vince, but I know before that, some of the promoters would, they would almost want their guys to go out and raise a little hell in the bar, but you just, you didn't lose. You couldn't lose. Otherwise that would just make the business look bad. You, had to you can't forget back. there was no, there was no social media back then. So you can exactly. do that shit. You get away with a lot. So when you more. came back to that town. Only people knew about the stupid shit you did was the people in that town. Right. I think the, the biggest news probably when I was coming up was when Sean got, uh, he got into those damn nine or supposedly Marines. And then they said nine. Some people said it wasn't that many. I don't know. I wasn't there, but that was probably the only story that kind of made big headways without the social media. What's the story? I don't you have to remind me. He was apparently at a bar. And I guess was saying something to the ladies. The ladies had some friends out there. Somehow or another, it made its way outside. I guess the guys followed him outside. Now, yeah. I know Davy Boy was there, and he was in the car, but they said he couldn't get out of the car or he didn't get out. But he took an ass whooping. That was the whole. Uh, I want to say around the time where he lost. Do you his ever life. hear the end of that story? I know he went to the hospital. Do you ever hear why? They didn't get up, get beat up more than they did. No. All right. The the Marines or Sean? Sean. No, I've never heard any of that. Either. Well, let's just say a, a group of good guys just happened to show up when that shit was happening, and we saved them from getting beat up a lot worse than what they did. Wow. So was it? I mean. Obviously, I don't want to get anybody in any heat, but well, Davy Boy, he's he's obviously passed away. Was he involved? I mean, what I heard was he couldn't even the get the thing out of the was ball. is those guys, those guys used to get drunk. And, and, and those guys are all cool, but a lot of them ain't tough guys. Right. And they would get, I mean, they're tough guys in their business, but they're not they're not really tough guys. In the street. And they would get drunk and they would start taking guys' girls, and then shit would happen. But uh, I would just say this, that uh, a group of my friends, me and BSK, who have nothing against that whole group, we saved them a few times. <laughs> um, who was probably the top dogs at handling their alcohol? What do you mean? Just who could drink? Who could drink? Everybody. Everybody. You know who can really drink? You know who can really drink? I can drink. Uh, Taker can drink. Yokozuna can really drink. I bet he could. <laughs> Bradshaw tells a story we were at a club in Chicago right or some fucking place I think it was Pittsburgh Chicago and they'd stop selling alcohol so Bradshaw paid for like Bradshaw wanted a bottle of Jack so Bradshaw it was uh, I don't know who was there but Bradshaw said we're in Pittsburgh we're in Pittsburgh it was after hours so Bradshaw paid like $300 for a bottle of Jack and somebody's like Godfather you can't drink that old fucking bottle right? I took a bottle just like this and drank the whole thing. And John Bradshaw, John Layfield will tell a story where I've never seen in my whole fucking life somebody drink a whole bottle of Jack. And I drank that bottle, $300 it cost him. Wow. <laughs> drink it straight down? Holy. I, 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 bro, I sit here bragging. That's how fucked up I was back then. I, I couldn't do it now. <laughs> but I remember later that night, I was pretty fucked up. I bet so. <laughs> well, I think that's about it, man. We're going to wrap it up. But the last thing, what's Charles Wright's top five all-time Mount Rushmore of wrestlers? Why do people always ask me that? I don't fuck. Jesus Christ. You should ask me top five stoners. <laughs> um, oh, well, fuck it. Let's do that. Let's do that. Top five stoners. If you don't want to get anybody, I don't want to get nobody in trouble. Oh, shit. How, how can you? I'm going to go with Snoop Dogg, 
Let me tell you the biggest stoner of everybody is Willie Nelson, Willie, who I've spoke Willie. with. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put myself in there. Uh, it's only going to be three. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm sure I could come up with more, but you Snoop smoke smokes another a lot. Two off the mountain. <laughs> uh, 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 Willie is like, he's weed. He doesn't do the dabs and all that yeah. shit, but Willie smoke a pound of weed in a week. Uh, <laughs> Cheech, uh, or Chong, I'll go with yeah. Chong. Tommy Chong. Tommy Chong, not Cheech, because that motherfucker don't even smoke. Yeah. Chong. And I'm, I'm begging somebody to show me a picture, a picture of Cheech smoking. Have huh. you ever seen Cheech smoke? No, Think not outside it. of the movie, no. <laughs> Probably. What oh. about Be Real might would be up there. Thank you. We're going to put Be Real on there. Yeah. I'm sorry, B. I didn't mean to fucking dog you like that, bro. <laughs> That's your top five stoner right there. Yeah, I see. There's this funny picture that's been circulating lately, uh, where it's like how high our gas price is going to get, and then it's a picture of Willie Nelson and Snoop Dogg together in the same room. <laughs> I think Snoop Dogg said that he ain't never seen nobody smoke smoke more weed than Willie Nelson. I can believe it. <laughs> now, now Willie, you're you're actually a big country music fan, right? A lot of people don't know that you're a big country <laughs> music fan. To this day. Who's your most favorite? I'm a, I'm a big fan artist. of the uh from the 80s. 80s. From 1980 from 1980 to 1990, that's all I listened to was country music. So what Keith Whitley? That was Keith Whitley, Garth. No, I ain't no Keith Whitley. That's 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 George Jones. George Jones. You okay. know, that's Hank Williams Jr. Yeah. That's David Allen Cole. Oh, that's, that's stuff like that. That ain't that ain't no Keith Whitley Jr. What yeah. what? DAC, uh what's Time off for bad behavior. I love that. I like the old country music, and and, and as I feel like, I heard David Allen Cole is the most racist motherfucker in the world, <laughs> but he had such cool songs. He did. And, uh, I mean, that's how I was living my wife life back then, man. Just drinking, fighting, and fucking. Oh, I don't know if I can say that. You can. You can. Yeah, <laughs> that that song, "Time Off for Bad Behavior," it starts off, and he's like. Been up at dawn since the crack of dawn. Been working like a regular dog to keep my woman in the water and the lights and the phone turned on. <laughs> there you go. And that's, I love it, man. I'm still doing that today. <laughs> well, Charles, man, I'm glad you could come by the show and sit down and talk with us. I'd had an absolute blast. I'm a huge wrestling fan, a huge Godfather fan, and you are my first wrestler to come on this podcast so that means a lot brother i really appreciate it oh man I, i've had nothing but fun i wasn't bored of people no absolutely not if, if you're a wrestling fan you these are the kind of stories you like to hear man that behind the scenes stuff and kind of put you in a little bit of the action because like you said when you were coming up in those days there wasn't any instagram social media facebook tmz to report every time you took a piss out back or something like that you know y'all guys could get away with a lot of stuff and have a lot more fun. And I'm sure you did. And, you know, you, you, you probably came up at the best time. Cause nowadays, I don't know if it pays to be with that big of a spotlight on you. Cause you can't do shit nowadays without it being It'd be a hard time for me to be myself <laughs> today. Yeah. Well, like I said, man, I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, you know, we'll have to sit down and do it again sometime. And if I ever get out in Nevada, definitely we'll have to uh, link up and I'll go check out your stuff out there at be real shop. 100 percent uh, nothing but love brother i want everybody to make sure you follow me on instagram yeah yeah the godfather on instagram on uh facebook i am the wwe godfather so make sure you check me out see what the crazy shit that i'm doing believe me i keep it i keep it pimping there you go all right folks i am hollywood wade that was the godfather and unfortunately we are out of time. Catch us here next week on an all-in-new episode of Crime and Entertainment.